Jump right into things tonight. Uh, of course, always uh, welcoming our visitors, uh, but also our members too. We, we never say I'm glad to see the members here, but uh, visitors particularly, I know some of you made a pretty good drive to get here tonight, and I'm grateful for that. And I want to invite you to grab your Bibles, and we're going to go together to first or to Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. We're going to be reading the here in just a moment. The book of Second Peter and in a similar way, the book of uh, 2 Timothy, are both books written, letters written, by men about to die. That was a great song choice, by the way, because uh, it really uh, uh, was, it was talking about a statement that Paul made in 2 Timothy. Paul was preparing to die. He saw that he was about to be poured out. He, he describes his incoming, and he's hope, he, it's a very personal letter to Timothy. And it's a letter in 2 Timothy, Timothy is a letter to, uh, about the, uh, the fact that, that Paul wasn't afraid. Because like the song we just sang, he knew what he had committed and to whom he had committed it. And so he knew that he had lived his life for the day that was coming. And that's what 2 Peter is. It's a book, a letter written by a man who's about to die. Verse 12 of chapter 1, Peter tells us for the reason he wrote this. He says, for this reason I'll... I'll, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. I think it is right as long as I'm in this tent, his body, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, I'm going to die, just as my Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Interesting, in, in the book of John, chapter 21, Jesus is talking to Peter, and Jesus tells Peter that when you're old, one day they're going to take you and they're going to lead you somewhere you don't want to go. And John makes it clear to us that was signifying how Peter would die. He would be put to death for the sake of Christ. I've always wondered, what would it be like to live uh, knowing you were going to be put to death one day? Um, would you live with boldness? You know, you think of Peter getting arrested in Acts chapter 12. Was he thinking about Jesus' promise and saying, I'm not worried because I'm, I'm not old yet. I haven't reached that point. What was that life like? And the answer's right here. Peter's not afraid. I don't know about you, but that, that, that makes the hair on my arm stand up. Can't say the hair on my head, but the hair on my arm stand up. Peter's not afraid. And Peter's about to tell us why he's not afraid. And he's going to say, it's because I once saw something happen that was so incredible that I'm certain, I'm certain everything I've done is worth it. And, and, and you might ask yourself for a moment, pretend you don't know what we're about to read here in, uh, in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, what would the thing that he saw be? You might think, well, it, it must be the resurrection. He saw Jesus alive. Jesus appeared to him, the Word of God says, in, in Luke chapter 24 specifically. Uh, he must have been, uh, or John 21 as well, where Jesus appeared to him. Maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe it was some incredible miracle. Well, why don't we just read it and find out? What is it that Peter saw happen that made him so certain that here at the end of his life, he's about to be put to death and he's not worried. He's not worried for himself. He just wants to make sure that you and I are grounded in the truth. He says in verse 16, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were on the holy mountain. I'd love to go on, but for the sake of time, we're going to stop here. What's he talking about? And you probably put it together. We're talking about an event that occurred uh, just months before Jesus would be put to death. And, and for us to kind of bring these things together for our thoughts tonight, let's jump back and read about this. And let's go back, if you would, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us about the event that we're reading about, an event that we call the transfiguration. That's what Peter is talking about, that moment when he saw the glory of Jesus revealed, he heard from heaven the voice of the Father. By the way, there's a great cloud that we'll see in a moment, and oftentimes the Holy Spirit manifests himself as a cloud. It makes us wonder if we're seeing the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in this moment. 
But it is the case, uh, it says in uh, Luke chapter 8, or Luke chapter 9, verse 28, it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. I tell you what, let's read verse 33. And it happened that as we were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he was saying. Verse 34, while he was saying this, a cloud, there's our cloud, came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Next verse says that the cloud dissipates, and Jesus is alone again, back in that form that they saw him in originally. Transfiguration. You know, obviously when you read this, you know this is something important. You know something significant has just happened. But a lot of times, I think it's kind of hard for us to put together what just happened. I think the apostles weren't too sure about what had just happened. Uh, in fact, as it goes on at verse 36, it says that Jesus said, don't talk about this till later. Well, that indicates it's something important, but I don't know if they really understood what exactly it was. But there's a lot of significance to this moment and the things that were happening here. Indeed, one of the last prophecies in the Old Testament was talking about the coming of Elijah. And right before that, in Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, uh, there's a command to the people to remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statues and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, I want to pause for a second so that I'm not confusing here. The coming of Elijah... You would read, if you, if you went on, actually, if you'd read this account in Matthew chapter 17, you'd be told Elijah is John the Baptist. Not, not a reincarnation, but a type. But there's also a sense where Moses and Elijah are tied together. And this moment isn't quite as unpredictable as we might think. Let's think for just a second about Jesus and Elijah and Moses here on this mountain in this moment. A lot of people always ask me, Brian, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? And I say, well, simple. They all had the trading cards. And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, did they hear what they were saying? Did they, uh, was it some kind of supernatural knowledge? Was it some important discernment? I'm not entirely sure. But they knew that they were looking at Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. What do those three men have in common? Uh, well, here's, here's a simple one. Uh, if you go to the Bible and you say, how many people fasted for 40 days? How, how many people? And your answer is three. Who was it? Well, it, oh yeah, it was Jesus. Matt, it, it was Elijah as he uh, traveled to Mount Horeb, which is also Mount Sinai. And it was Moses on Mount Sinai. Those three people fasted for 40 days. If you wanted to go to the grave of one of these men, could you do that? We said, well, no, of course not. Jesus arose from the grave. And you probably remember, oh yeah, and Elijah, uh, he, he never died. He was taken away. And Moses, when he died, his body was hidden by God. That's kind of interesting. By the way, Moses and Elijah, both their lives, I'll say carefully since Elijah didn't die, but their lives came to an end at the same location. They both went back over the other side of the Jordan out of Israel that uh, Elijah did, and Moses didn't enter into Israel, and they both, uh, Moses' life came to an end, and Elijah was taken away at the same location. That's, that's kind of interesting. There was a prophecy that Elijah would come back. We just saw that. But Moses in Deuteronomy said one day there would be a prophet like him that would come. Uh, he was talking about Jesus. And of course, we all understand that Jesus is prophesied to return. So, so it's kind of interesting to see a connection in these three. But but that's really not the significance of the thing that Peter is, in 2 Peter, saying this was such a big deal. If we want to appreciate this, we might try to understand 
who these other two men were that were with Jesus. Moses, uh, the law of Moses, as we saw a moment ago in that passage in Malachi, Moses is usually the one considered to be the bringer of the law. And a lot of times Moses is just a personification of the law. They'll say a lot of times when they're talking about the law, they'll say Moses said, da, 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 because Moses is the law. But what's interesting is that Elijah seems to have that same characteristic when it comes to prophets. Elijah seems to be the typification of that. Uh, uh, I also think of the idea that whenever Elijah appoints his successor, Elisha, that he gives the mantle of Elijah. The mantle of Elijah, that's, that's both symbolic and it was literal too, but it was symbolic of the idea of the prestige of him. A indeed, uh, you know, they would say, hey, the spirit of Elijah is on Elisha. And, and I just want to suggest to you that it wouldn't be far off for us to say that Elijah could be like a personification of the prophets. Why do you want to know this? Well, how about all those times where when the New Testament talks about the things that Jesus the things that Jesus had come to bring to an end, it talks about them as the law and the prophets. When Jesus gives us the Sermon on the Mount, don't think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to put them away. Now, you know, it's interesting. Jesus might have said something like this in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, and, you know, the apostles would say, well, you know, he's going to, uh, you know, what's he going to do? He's going to fulfill these things. He's going he's to complete these things. But then, whenever they're on this mountain and they see Jesus, and Jesus is talking to the prophets, Elijah, to the law, Moses, and then they hear the Father speak and there's three times in the New Testament the Father speaks from heaven. Jesus is baptized here. Right before Jesus dies, Jesus has to be glorified. They're all big deal moments. And the Father says, this is my son. Listen, listen to him. Peter invested the rest of his life on the idea that Jesus is the one to listen to of those three. And that's actually the idea that I want us to kind of move into tonight. The Peter's last message to us, the thing he wants us to see, and, and by the way, 2 Peter is such a captivating book, uh, whether he's talking about how you can, how you can be certain to, to make your calling secure by growing yourself constantly, or whether he's talking later about you know, the false teachers that come or the end of the world. But it was this part here that, that has always been the part that catches me the most, that he says, you know what, I want you to know why I'm so sure. Because I know Jesus is superior. There's a passage written in the book of Hebrews, book of Hebrews, a, a marvelous book that talks a lot about the superiority of Christ. And it's kind of going to be the, the point we're launching our thoughts from, because I want us to, as I said, take things a little bit of a different course for a moment and talk about one of the heavier ideas of the New Testament. Now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is, a, he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. The transfiguration is a moment where there is a visible personification of the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. The New Testament, Jesus Christ. And the Father is saying, listen to my son. There's something dramatic here. And and the way that I think it is best to approach this is to, first of all, ask a question uh, that maybe you've already asked. Maybe you have a good understanding of, but maybe this is an opportunity for us merely to refresh ourselves. What exactly is a covenant? And I'll tell you from the start, it is one of the most important words in the Bible. You probably know already that the word covenant and the word testament are the same. So when I said a moment ago, the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, you'll know some translations will just say the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In fact, the, uh, the passage I just put up for you might have had those words uh, interchanged in that way. And a covenant is a great part of the subject of the book of Hebrews because one of the points of the book of Hebrews is that the covenant of Christ is better than the covenant that came before. 
and we see a lot of language about that. I really appreciate reading Jeremiah 31 this evening as we got started, because Jeremiah 31 was a prophet who was living at the, at the end times of his time, so to speak, the end of Judah, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple that happened in the year 586, and Jeremiah is a witness of this, yet at the same time, God is saying, hey, but in the future, I'm going to set up a new covenant. And it was fantastic. We got to read that passage for a moment where Jeremiah saw what that covenant was going to be like. He said, it's going to be different than the covenant that came before. This is the covenant I'll make with them after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts and their minds and will write them and their, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. I want to kind of simplify the idea of a covenant tonight. Uh, I'm going to simplify it to a degree that it, you know, that we're kind of compressing a lot of thoughts into it. When somebody asks me what a covenant is, I usually just summarize it by saying a covenant is two things that are brought together in a unique way. The first one is law. All throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, you'll find that when they're talking about covenants, oftentimes they'll say law. The covenant of God, the law of God. Uh, we see the idea that a covenant is called a law time and time again, Old Testament and New Testament, just like, just like in this passage here. A covenant contains laws. Here's another passage for us to consider just before that in the book of Hebrews. It says that Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry. We read this one a moment ago. Inasmuch as much as of a better covenant, which was established on. Here's the other thing that a covenant is made out of. It is made out of promises. Somebody asked me, Brian, what, what would you say a covenant is? And like I said, it's, it's a complex idea, but, but to boil it down simply, I'll always say a covenant is the combination of a law and a promise. Now, I need to explain what I mean by that. What, what would you describe a law as? My favorite example of a law is a speed limit sign, uh, as far as just trying to illustrate my point. When you see a speed limit sign, what is that doing? It is telling you the law. Now, what happens if you're going down the road uh, and you're going above that speed limit? Well, there is a penalty for violating law. Law is that term or condition where if I go beyond it, if I transgress law, there is penalty for it. Now, say we were driving over tonight. I was driving over tonight. Uh, I think I was going about five under, mainly because I don't know what the speed limit was, but passed a police officer. Now imagine I pulled over that police officer. I said, officer, officer, I want you to know I was going under the speed limit. What kind of reward do I get for that? Well, he'd probably, he'd probably give me a breathalyzer at that moment, wanting to know what that is. Why? Because, because laws don't have a reward. They don't give you something for fulfillment. But that's the other side of a covenant, a promise. Tell you, what, you, you probably talked to Nick about this. He can explain this a little more, the, uh, the idea of what a contract is. A contract is an agreement between two people where there is a promise made and when somebody acts on that, they receive what's promised. When you get a newspaper ad, that's the other example I like for a contract or a promise. When you get a newspaper ad and it says you can buy, uh, what did we see? Wendy and I saw corn today. It was uh, six for five dollars. And you can buy uh, ears of corn six for five dollars. Uh, that's a promise that if I accept that and I give them the, the five dollars, they give me my reward. My performance is giving them five dollars. They give me they give me six years of course. If, if Gary says to me, Brian, Brian, come over, mow my lawn, I'll give you $10. I, well, I'll say, You're, I've seen your lawn, I don't know. But he's made a promise to me, if I fulfill it, I receive $10. Now, now the difference is, if I choose not to do it, or if I get over there and I say, wow, Gary, your, your yard is big. This isn't worth $10. Well, when a contract has that, both parties go back. A covenant isn't like that. A covenant has two elements to it. It has a reward if you do what's right, and it has a penalty if you do what's wrong. And there's next to, and I say this carefully because we're not going to say nothing, there's next to nothing that really is like that in our society today. The idea of the covenant. Now, 
in addition to this idea, if we say, okay, a covenant is, I could see that it has a law, a command, and it has a promise or a reward. What else does a covenant have? Well, the Bible gives us some other uh, statements about a covenant. I'm kind of thinking of what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul talking about the covenants that had been given through Abraham that came before the covenant of Moses. And here Paul says in Galatians 3 and verse 15, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Element two of a covenant. Element one, it is made of a law and a promise. Something that has a command and something that has kind of a contract. Something to be received. But number two, once a covenant is established, it doesn't go away. One of the few times that we do still have covenants in our, in our legal system are with property. And, uh, you know, when you buy a house, you find out there's a covenant with it that, that goes from person to person, and it's supposed to stay until that covenant is fulfilled. A covenant in the Bible, in the scriptures, is unbreakable and unchangeable once it is established. This is important. Now, in the context of this passage, Paul was talking about the covenant of Abraham, which was before the covenant of Moses. And he's also trying to say that a subsequent covenant is, is less than the preceding covenant if the preceding covenant is still in place. You might say, Brian, I don't know if I just caught what you said. Say it again. Paul was trying to say that the covenant of Abraham was greater because it existed beforehand than the covenant of Moses. And he went on to illustrate a couple of ways. Number one, the covenant of Abraham applied to more people than the covenant of Moses. Moses' covenant was just with the Israelites, uh, between them and God. Abraham, all nations would be blessed, Paul would point out. And that promise was greater than the promise of fulfillment for the Israelites. Their covenant was less than that covenant of Abraham. By the way, we'll come back to this in a moment. There was even a covenant before Abraham. You might remember there was, there was a covenant with Noah. A greater covenant applying to all mankind, you could say. So one of the things that Paul is trying to get across in the book of, Hebrew, in the book of Galatians is, first of all, once a covenant's in place, it doesn't go away until it's fulfilled. Number two that even if another covenant comes along, it's going to be less than the one before it, as long as the one before it is in place. Now, I've used that term a couple of times, in place. What, what puts a covenant to its end? Its fulfillment, and its fulfillment, according to the Word of God, is by death. So here in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9 and verse 15, talking about Jesus being the mediator of the new covenant. He says Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. The new covenant comes by way of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Death is what ends a covenant. Death is what ends a covenant. Now, all this language about covenant, you're, you're probably thinking now about different ways and times we've used that word from time to time. Just Sunday morning when we were partaking of the Lord's Supper, we were talking about how Jesus says that the, uh, that the fruit of the vine is his blood, which, which purchases the new covenant. His body, the reason we take them in that order, by the way, the bread first and then the fruit of the vine, his body puts to death the first covenant. His blood purchases the second covenant. Every time we come together, we take them in that order because that order is actually important. It relates to how one covenant is put away, one covenant is purchased. If you are a Christian today, you are in the covenant of Jesus Christ. Meaning you're under the law of Christ, but you're also a recipient of the promise of Christ. It is a permanent, not one you get out of, circumstance. 
Indeed, when we read passages like 2 Peter chapter 2, where Peter is talking about uh, those that have, have partaken of the, well, we'll say for the context of our lesson, those that have partaken of the covenant of Christ, he says if they turn away, he says they are in a worse condition than they were before. That's one of the subject uh, natures of a covenant, that if you break the covenant that you've entered into, you are in a worse condition than you were before entering it. That's a statement that's found repeatedly, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Do you remember, do you remember Mount Ebal and the curses and the blessings and, and God lines the Israel up and he, he says to them, if you do what I say, you'll receive all these promises, but if you break my law, here are the curses, you're worse off than you were before. That's a covenant. That's a covenant conversation. It's true of the covenant of Moses, true of the covenant of Christ that if we break it, we are in a worse condition than we were before. Now, breaking the covenant doesn't end it, by the way. That's kind of an important idea that uh, here in just a moment, we'll jump over to something in Romans chapter 7 to reinforce that idea. But, but just breaking it doesn't mean that the covenant is dissolved. It still owns us until death. But if we, for example, are in the covenant of Christ and we break it, it becomes to us a curse. That's what the New Testament writers say time and time again, that to be in violation of the covenant of Christ is to be in a worse condition than had we never entered it. It's interesting as we try to understand this better that the Word of God would tell us that all mankind is under the law of Christ, the Christ's covenant is a law and a promise, but all mankind is under the law. The Word of God tells us that, that Jesus is the lawgiver and the judge of all mankind. Jesus repeatedly says he, uh, that he'll judge all mankind throughout the New Testament. His, his apostles, his disciples will tell us that Jesus is going to, on a day he is determined, judge all mankind. This was Paul's message in Acts chapter 17. Everybody's under the law of Christ. Every human being in the world today is under the law of Christ, but we are not, not all human beings are under that promise. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 25, this is the promise He has promised to us. Listen to this carefully. 1 John 2 and verse 25, this is the promise He has promised us. Eternal life. Now, if, if you've been able to follow what we've been talking about up till now, as we come to this critical point, you're going to appreciate something that's something you already knew to be true, but now you're finding a framework for why that truth is so significant. When you came to Jesus Christ and you put on Christ, we talked last night about putting Christ on in baptism. When you put on Christ in baptism and you connected to him and, and the blood of Christ uh, 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 did its work with you, and by the way, blood and covenants, uh, another thing to examine, blood uh, covenant is always inaugurated with blood. The Hebrew writer would remind us of this. But when you came to that co covenant with Christ, you're, you were under the law of Christ before that, but now you received the promise. There's a couple of things that come with that promise. Uh, as it says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 25, eternal life, but it's also the idea of a forgiveness of sins that allows us to have eternal life. Only Christians have that promise. That is a simple covenant truth that only those who are in Christ can say they have the promise of the forgiveness of sins. And this statement that is made time and time again about what it is that we are recipients of, that promise of Christ is tremendous. Well, I said a moment ago that there, there are very, very few models of what we might compare this to, but you probably would have said, Brian, I can think of at least one covenant that's still around. You're right, marriage. The Word of God tells us, the book of Haggai, for example, the Word of God, or I'm sorry, Malachi tells us, uh, uh, the Word of God says that marriage is a covenant relationship. And you think of everything that you thought you were told about a covenant a moment ago, how a covenant is a law and a promise, and how a covenant uh, is something that is an unbreakable oath that, that, is only, uh, that is only brought to its conclusion by death, and that if you violate that covenant, the covenant doesn't go away. You begin to realize, well, you know, that, those are the things we talk about when we teach on marriage and what marriage is about. 
Malachi 2 and verse 14, God talked about the covenant of marriage and how he wasn't pleased. The Israelites weren't honoring that. Indeed, it's interesting whenever God talks about his relationships with mankind, for example, when he talks about his relationship with Israel, he talks about it as a marriage. What is the church called for Jesus? The bride of Christ. Why does God use language of marriage? Because it's a covenant. And the terms of a covenant apply. A covenant has laws. It has things that we are commanded to do and fulfill. Uh, I can think of a lot of different passages. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about some of the things that we're commanded to be a part of, that we're commanded to fulfill in marriage. Ephesians 5 and uh, it talks about husbands and wives. And Colossians 3 uh, tells what we're each, uh, what we are each, obligated to do within that law of marriage. And it talks also about the promises or the rewards of marriage. At Matthew chapter 19, Jesus talks about the two becoming one flesh. The coming together of the home, the partnership of marriage. Romans chapter 7. Now let's turn there for just a second because this will be important here in a moment. Romans chapter 7, Paul Paul talking about marriage, but he's actually also talking about the covenant of Christ, but he's teaching us both. And in Romans chapter 7, verse 1, Paul says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Well, this is one of those times, too, where that word covenant is used in a way that uh, you could say the word law is a synonym of a covenant here, that the concept of the covenant has dominion as long as we live. That would be in in the same text as what the Hebrew writer has told us, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. If the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law. So she's not an adulteress, though she has married another man. Let's pause here for a second. What is Paul trying to say? Paul Paul's telling us about marriage. He's talking about a universal truth. He's saying that the marriage covenant is something that if two people come together in a covenant of marriage, that if they break apart, that that covenant still has sway. So that if that woman joins herself to another man, she's an adulteress. Because that covenant, as long as they're alive, holds them down. Now, we, you, by the way, we, we know Jesus gave an exception to that in Matthew 19, but but Paul's point here is just trying to bind us to understand this significance that here he's saying that even if they decide, well, we're not going to be together anymore, the covenant still holds. Now, Paul's point was actually about the Israelites. They had been unfaithful to God. God had, you know, the word divorce is used several times in the Old Testament. God had put them away. They uh, no longer received the promises of their covenant. Do we appreciate that idea that the Israelites were taken away from the promise of the covenant of God? They didn't get the promised land. It was given to somebody else. They merely became the servants of others. They didn't have all the benefits that God had told them they would have, but they were still held under law and that they would be until the one who made that covenant with them died. That's the point Paul wants us to consider. This is a truth about marriage, that the marriage covenant lasts until death. It's truth, though, about covenants in general. Breaking covenants would have a consequence. Why is all of this so significant? Well, it, let's appreciate the idea that God has always dealt with mankind with covenant relationships. And if we, if we can understand that, let me just kind of throw some ideas at you for a second to think about this. Then we can appreciate the idea that from the very beginning, God was dealing with mankind through that first person who is Adam, who is man, by a covenant. When God began talking to Adam. Did he give him a law? Yeah. Did he give him promises? Yeah. The law was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The promise was the tree of life. God gave him a law. God gave him a promise. But then Adam broke it. Did that covenant still hold? Well, Paul would say it nicely when he said, death continued to reign. The next covenant that comes along, Noah's covenant, it's a, it's a lesser covenant because the covenant that Adam has broken is still 
is still hanging over mankind. Mankind is still subject to the problems of death. Uh, Noah, uh, in Genesis 9 and verse 9, a covenant is made between Noah and his descendants. That's the human race at that time. The covenant says, uh, you know, I could just call it the Noah law where he says you're not to, you know, uh, you're not to drink blood. You're, he speaks about the nature of life. He says, as a, as a promise to that, God says, I will not flood the earth again. I won't destroy the earth again. Abraham has a covenant made, uh, again, a descendant of Noah, uh, a lesser covenant in the sense that it is more specific to uh, his descendants in part. But of course, we also point out that, as we mentioned before, that the, the promise of the seed was something that was to all mankind, making it greater than that next covenant, the covenant of Moses. In Genesis chapter 19, giving us the law and the promised land. And let's pause here for a second and say this, with these covenants, they are becoming less and less each time. Uh, today, there's a lot of people that like to make a lot of uh, big, uh, a big deal about the covenant of Moses and say, well, you know, we still got the promised land. The promised land was a diminished promise from the prior covenants. The prior covenants were greater covenants. Ironically, they lost that promised land when they broke their covenant with idolatry and the, the different ways that they were unfaithful to God. But the dilemma is these covenants existed still because going back to Adam, mankind had been unfaithful. So what had to happen? That's actually the point that Paul was trying to make in Romans chapter 7. Therefore, my brethren, he says, you have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, for we should bear fruit to God. And one of the most important questions people ask sometimes is they say, why does Jesus have to die on the cross? You know, and I know that, you know, sometimes the answer we say is, well, because God loved us, because this was, but why was that necessary? It was necessary because of the nature of a covenant. That unless the party who made the covenant died, mankind, going back to Adam, was under the curse. Book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul was trying to make a connection between Adam and Christ, and he was trying to make the point that Adam brought death, <coughs> Christ brings life. The covenants that were made the innocent party would die. Now that's important because that means that since it was God who made the covenants, it would need to be God who died. Jesus is God in the flesh. If Jesus was not God in the flesh, then those covenants wouldn't be put away when Jesus came and presented his law and offered his promises and brought forth the truth about where his covenant would come from. Jesus had to be God in the flesh. He had to die. And by dying, the Hebrew writer will tell us that by dying, he then puts away these previous covenants so that the new covenant can be inaugurated. What's interesting about that new covenant, as we mentioned already, Jesus' promises of what it is that he offers to us. Uh, we've said it's the law of Christ and all men are under the law of Christ, but there's also the sense where he has offered grace and salvation. Uh, we could just say from 1 John we saw a moment ago, it is eternal life. And what's interesting about that is that that's, in a way, the promise from the beginning. Jesus is restoring not merely the promises of the covenant before him through Moses. Uh, we didn't even mention the covenant made with Phineas or the covenant made with David, which Jesus fulfills as well. But he goes all the way back to Adam. And so Paul would say Adam was the first spirit, the first man, and Jesus is the man, the second man in a way, the man who is the life giver by the inauguration of the new covenant. The inauguration of the new covenant built on a better law, the law of Christ, with better promises, the promise of eternal life. 
There's a lot of information. There's a lot of things to think about, but perhaps as you start to put these thoughts together, you're drawing conclusions that are really important. Uh, conclusions that help you perhaps to understand some of the more significant misunderstandings that are in the world around us. Uh, misunderstandings that for a lot of times have led people to, uh, to truly false doctrines about the way things come. Uh, God's blessings come through covenants. Now today, there are times where people want to say that, you know, you'll hear your denominational friends say, well, you know, there's no, there's no law now. We've, we're under grace. Well, if there's no law, there's no covenant. If there's no covenant, there's no promise. You cannot have a promise without law because there's no covenant. There has to be a law of Christ. And that's a simple truth. Somebody comes along and says, well, yeah, but I'm going to be saved by just doing the Ten Commandments. Which covenant were the Ten Commandments under? They were on Moses' covenant. And that covenant was put away by death. You cannot go back to that. Somebody says, you know, I think the land of Israel today is a, is a special place. Where do you get that? Well, I get that from the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant's put away. There's only the covenant of Christ today. Somebody says, you know, I, I, I like to think of the idea of once saved, always saved. Well, covenant language says if you break a covenant, you're actually in a worse condition than you were beforehand. Word of God tells us repeatedly that if I fall away, I am worse off. That's covenant language. And somebody who says, well, I believe in once saved, always saved, doesn't appreciate the covenant of Christ is where salvation lies. Some of the teachings on marriage and divorce today are, are teachings that deny the concept of a covenant. I, uh, people saying, well, you know, if, uh, if, the, if, if somebody cheats on somebody else, then the marriage covenant is dissolved. You know, that would have been real handy for the Israelites. It would have been handy for God. Jesus wouldn't have had to die. If a marriage could just be dissolved by fornication and both parties are then free, Jesus didn't need to die. But the Word of God says the only way a new covenant could be inaugurated was that Jesus had to be God in the flesh. And by the way, that speaks to those that might say Jesus is not God in the flesh. If he wasn't God in the flesh, his death would not have put away the covenants God made. Because by being God and dying on the cross, that was the only way mankind could be saved. Somebody says, I, you know, I, I look back to go back to these other things. You can't. Paul put it nicely when he said, if you're trying to go back to, the, to a justification of these things beforehand, he says, you're crucifying Christ again. You're, you're bringing him to an open shame. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about uh, crucifying Christ again. In Galatians, Paul talks about the idea that you make Jesus' death in vain, a vain thing, a meaningless thing. We can't go back to be justified by the Old Testament. The Old Testament was nailed to the cross. That's why Jesus came. When Jesus began preaching, he was preaching his new law for a covenant that he would inaugurate with his blood. And every week we come together on the first day of the week in the way that he has given to us to remind ourselves by that bread that was his body that died on the cross that those things were put away. And by that cup that is the fruit of the vine that is his blood that this is what my relationship with God cost. And as we partake of those things in that order, we are saying... We appreciate and understand what the nature of a covenant is. Let's take a moment here and let's go to our Father in a word of prayer. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Most holy God and Father in heaven, we come before you now. Thanking you, Father, for the time that you've given us this evening, that we have had an opportunity to contemplate the great and marvelous things that you have worked for us. How it is, Father, that throughout time we can see your planning and your working to, to deliver us from our sins. And Father, we've come to see tonight just how complex and beautiful your work was. 
that you were working uh, uh, with this purpose, this eternal purpose as you have told us it is, that we might have a justification and a forgiveness of sins. And we see, Father, this evening just how expensive that was and just how marvelous your gift is. Father, those of us who have put on this covenant tonight, help us to treasure it and to appreciate it and to, to see its value and to see also the seriousness that comes with this. How dangerous it is to break a covenant, Father, and to be found in a violation. But how merciful you are that even then your covenant with our Savior Jesus, through our Savior Jesus allows us the opportunity to, to plead and to, to return to you. Father, thank you for this marvelous gift revealed so long ago when you told your apostles, the apostles, that they should listen to your son. Let us listen to your son too. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. I said it a moment ago, I want to say it again. All mankind is under the law of Christ. We know that because Jesus is the judge of all mankind. The judge, James chapter 4 says, is the one who gives the law. Jesus gives the law. It is the royal law, James chapter 2 says. It is the law of liberty. That is the law all men are accountable to. But those who are in the covenant of Christ have an opportunity to be cleansed of any unrighteousness, to be forgiven of their sins. But joining yourself to the covenant of Christ requires you to make a choice. And that choice is the process of, of how covenants work. You know, covenants are always inaugurated with, with blood, it says, and, and we can understand that it was the blood of Christ that purchases this covenant. And how do we come into the covenant, contact with that blood? Last night we talked about how important it is that a person hears God's word and he believes it. He makes that choice to confess with his mouth that Jesus is Lord. He makes a choice to turn away from sin, and then he submits himself or herself to baptism, Baptism is connecting to the blood of Christ, the blood which purchases that new covenant. Baptism is the washing away of our sin. Baptism is that transformative moment that enters us into that covenant relationship. And when we arise out of that water, we arise a new creation. Here's the most marvelous thing about the covenant of Christ, though. We're probably not going to be perfect. We're going we're gonna to stumble. 1 John chapter 1, John reminds us of this. Don't say you're without sin. He says that, that, that that's simply not true. But he says something in 1 John chapter 1, in verse 9, that is, a, that is only for those in the covenant of Christ. He says that if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You catch that? We can bring our sins to Christ in the covenant of Christ, and they can be taken away just like that. If you're not in the covenant of Christ, you know, the Word of God, th this is mind-blowing for some people. The Word of God describes an idea that God doesn't hear you. How can He? If you don't have that covenant relationship with Him, John chapter 9 and verse 31, there's a pretty profound statement that says God doesn't hear sinners. It's a statement made over and over again in the Scriptures. God doesn't have a relationship to listen to somebody who's not His child. But God wants all men to be saved. He wants all men to be His children, and His Son has, has opened the veil, has inaugurated through His flesh a means by which we can do it if we'll submit to Him. And from then on, it merely becomes our willingness to change, and uh, I need to add to confession, to repent, of course, to turn away from the sins we commit, and we are cleansed of all unrighteousness. Well, every time we've come together, we've offered an opportunity. If somebody's not in Christ, you have nothing to lose that's bad by joining Christ, but you have everything to gain. Eternal life. The, the certain knowledge that God hears your prayers, that when you stumble, God will cleanse you of unrighteousness when you confess your sins. And the, the offer there that Christ has made to us in this way, it's the kind of offer that we say, how, how could I say no? We also make it clear that for those who are in Christ, this, one of these great opportunities we have is that we offer to bear each other's burdens, to lift each other up, to encourage each other. 
Bear one another's burdens, Paul says in Galatians 6 and verse 2, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There's the law of Christ, part of the covenant that we are under. And part of its fulfillment is that we are taking care of one another. Maybe there's something you need some prayers about. Maybe there's something you need some encouragement about. As I've said every time we've come together, you can always grab somebody after service and say, hey, I, there's something that was said tonight I'd like to talk to someone about. I'd like to study some more. Maybe though you say, you know what, I actually know what I need to do. I need to talk to somebody right now. I need to do something right now. And if that's the case, well, why don't you come up here and visit with me while we stand and we sing a song to encourage.